You know you have a good idea when you can't stop thinking about it. Your job running a company and being the boss is to lead with a compass and not a map. Nothing feels better than winning with a team. Trust me, nothing. It will not be about the companies you build or products you ship or code you write or deal you sell. It'll be about the team that you did it with. morning. Wow. Holy cow. This is uh, really a, a dream come true to be standing center stage at a venue like this. I don't know if everybody here knows the background of this theater and the greats that have been here and the amazing performances. Rock and roll history has been made on this stage. And to follow Brian from, uh, from that company, which is an incredible company, incredible product, and to be with you all today is really a dream come true. So thank you so much for your time and your attention today. So. Again, I'm Mark Josephson, I'm the CEO of Bitly, and I love to build companies and tell stories. And I know it takes a special kind of person and a special kind of talent to be involved in startups, whether you're starting it or you're working at one. And that, ta that special talent, that special feature is a light that sits inside of each and every one of you. It is a little fire that is ignited only by yourself, that pushes you to be the best possible version of yourself that you can be. That little light is what we call greater than, not equal to. It's one of our core values that we have at Bitly. It's the first core value, and we all have bracelets that have greater than, not equal to on it. Greater than, not equal to is an essential ingredient for working at a startup and for building companies because there is nobody who can turn that light on for you. You are the only person who can turn that on and to feed that fire that sits inside of you. And it's something we talk a lot about at the company. It's something I talk a lot about with my family and my boys, my three boys. And I think it's an essential ingredient that we'll talk more about today as we walk through. So I like to build businesses and tell stories. The business that I'm building today is Bitly. Bitly is the world's largest and most adored link shortener. Raise your hand if you use Bitly or have used Bitly before. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I love the product, and it's the, the quality of the product is what drove me to be here um, and to do this. Bitly is the fifth startup I've been a part of and to help build. First one was a win. Second one went out of business. Third one was a win I'll talk about. Fourth one went out of business, and now Bitly. Batting average is pretty good for the industry, but wow, what a roller coaster. At Bitly, we're known for shortening links, but God, it was so cool to follow Brian and have him and listen to him talk about vision and talk about mission and the things that unite a company and drive growth and make things happen. At Bitly, we believe that trusted, meaningful connections fuel communication and understanding. That's our vision statement. And I believe so strongly in helping create a world 
where we actually have meaningful conversations and we can have the connection that really matters. We do a thing in our company called Bitly Excellence. Bitly Excellence is a meeting you have once a month as a manager with somebody on your team that forces you to ask the questions that you're afraid to ask. So you can have the most meaningful connections and most meaningful conversations. What's the, what's the one co question that a manager is afraid to ask their employee? Are you happy coming to work each day? Right? Because you want everybody to be happy, but you're afraid the answer might be no. Right? But really, your biggest fear is that they're not happy. So meaningful connections, fuel communication and understanding is an essential, essential ingredient for the world that we want to live in and we want to build towards. So what do we actually do? Yeah, we shorten a lot of links, um, and we do them all day long. But what we're focused on, particularly in this new chapter of our business, which we, the, the intro alluded to, is empowering businesses, businesses, not consumers, to create trusted, powerful, recognizable links that maximize the impact of every digital initiative. Not everybody knows that most of our volume happens outside of social media, in email, SMS messages, push notifications, um, in app, not just on, on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that as well. We have um, massive scale, which is, uh, which, if, which is a blessing. And uh, as the information showed, I didn't start the company, but I've been running it for five and a half years. And we create hundreds of millions of links each month billions of clicks, more than about half of the world's population clicks on one of our links uh, every month. Um, and that is in every country in the world, thousands a second. And in the past uh, five years, we've scaled from zero to about two thirds of the Fortune 500 uh, using our product and, um, and helping them build more meaningful connections to their customers and to their businesses and to drive meaningful impact. And I love building businesses. It is a, such a puzzle. And part of what everybody who is involved in a business, in a startup, needs to know and needs to love is embracing the unknown and embracing the puzzle and figuring that out every day. Okay, so I love to build businesses and I love to tell stories. I am uh, a kid at heart and I think that children's books actually get it right more often than grown-up books. I'm not, I don't actually read business books for grown-ups. I don't have time. Right? I'm running a business, being a father, being a husband, trying to have a life, and I just feel like I'm just too in the weeds to actually read big grown-up books. But as the father of three boys, I've read every children's book out there, and I think the children's books have more truth and boil it down to fewer words, which is you know, making things big, making them smaller, something that we love to do. So my favorite book for entrepreneurs is The Carrot Seed. Raise your hand if you're familiar with this book. How about Harold and the Purple Crayon? You guys remember how, yeah, that was probably a little bit more of a bestseller. Same author, right? So, by the way, I didn't tell you I was like a great storyteller because I'm a kid's book storyteller. Um, but the carrot seed is the story of a boy with a dream. And that dream is to grow a carrot, right? And the entire world, his entire world, lines up against him and gets in his way. The story is repetitive. It's not hard to remember. And, it, and, the, and the, it's a board book. So every day, that boy pulls out the weeds and sprinkles the ground with water. And his mother says, I'm afraid it won't come up. And his father says, I'm afraid it won't come up. And his asshole older brother says, it's not coming up. Okay? But what does that boy do the next day? He goes outside, pulls up the weeds, and sprinkles the ground with water. Then it repeats. And every day, the people he cares about the most, and who apparently know everything, tell him he's doing it wrong, and he's wasting his time. And every day, that boy goes out, and what does he do? He works and he makes it happen. Well, I don't want to ruin the ending, but I'm going to tell you the ending at the end. But, well, I just told you the ending. But I will tell you that this sounds a whole lot like my experience in helping to build five companies, right? If I listened every day to what the world told me about what we were doing that was wrong, or if I decided not to get up and go to work, 
or not to fulfill my goals that I had deliverables for my team, it's not going to happen, right? So I believe that this book should be required reading for everybody involved in startups. By the way, if I'm lucky enough to be invited next, back next year, I'll do the little engine that could. That's a whole other amazing startup story. So I took six lessons from this book that I want to talk to you about today that for me encompass uh, some really key learnings that I've, I've gotten not only from this book but from nearly, well now over 24 years uh, involved in startups in the technology space. <sighs> the first one, how many founders do we have in the room today? Great, congratulations, that's so hard. How many people here work at startups? Right. Okay, that's really amazing, right? If I've had, um, uh, I've had conversations with hundreds, if not thousands of folks who have said, I want to work at a startup or I want to start a company. And the first question I always ask is, do you have an idea? And the answer is, mm, no, right? It's really hard to come up with an idea. I think this is the hardest thing. And, and full transparency, I've never started something from zero. So I am unique in that way. I have a tremendous amount of respect for founders and folks who, are, uh, who come up with that little spark of an idea. Um, but ideas can happen at all parts of the, of the life cycle of a company. So when I joined the company in Bitly in 2013, the company had been around for five years. Rocket ship growth. Everybody in the world was using this link shortener. It was massive distribution. Huge numbers, right? There's not there weren't 20 companies in the world that had the size of audience and size of user base that this company had, but we weren't selling anything. It was all free, okay? So my idea that I was passionate about was that let's start charging, <laughs> right? Let's turn this into a business. Let's build product, position the product, uh, make sure that we're creating value for our customers, and then let's get them to pay us for it. That's an idea. Right? It's not a unique idea but it's one that I believed in my heart and soul and brain and from my experience that we could do. We had millions of people using the product, including the biggest companies in the world. They were seeing some value. How do we share that value back? So how do you know if you have a good idea? You know you have a good idea when you can't stop thinking about it. When you are obsessed with this idea, you wake up thinking about it, you go to bed thinking about it, your friends are like, Mark, enough. Right? Just fucking do it now, right? When you're there, that's when you know you have a great idea. I think you have a responsibility to research your idea, to try to find the 15 things wrong with it, because the world will tell you those 15 things when you're doing it. But you need to come up with an idea, and that idea could be everything from something entirely new. I'm trying to think of one for links, longer links maybe. Um, or it could be something as simple as, hey, why don't we charge? Or why don't we make this blue instead of green, right? Coming up with an idea is the hard part. Believing in it is the powerful part. And I believe that the hardest part of any startup is coming up with the idea. And passion is everything. Lesson number two. This is not an easy path, okay? This is not for the faint of heart. If you think you're going to work at a startup or start a company or be in charge and have work-life balance, you're kidding yourself, okay? Um, those of us who were around when the black, first BlackBerry came out back in the ni late 90s, early 2000s, that's when you started looking down like this all the time and spending more time looking at what's on your phone or device than you did at who's in front of you, and it buzzed 24 hours a day, okay? The, The good news is that we all seem to have found some way, and there are ways to change the expectation of work-life balance. It doesn't necessarily mean you come to work at 9 and you leave at 5, because the expectation really is, is that you're always on, because you can be, right? I was with my team last night, and they were leaving the office out here, and they had calls with India and uh, the Far East last night at like 10 o'clock. I didn't ask them to do that. I'm really psyched that they did, um, but that's because that's where your customers are, and you need to build that. Okay? So when I was at Bitly, and I joined, and on my first day, I talked to the company, and I said, okay, there were about 45 people at the company, and I said, raise your hand if you work on the consumer product. 
Okay, this was a test. They should have known this was coming, right? Everybody raised their hand. I said, raise your hand if you work on the enterprise product. One and a half people, right? Some guy put his hand halfway up, right? Because he was splitting his time. One and a half people. And I said, okay, starting today, everybody works on the enterprise product. That was a hard message, okay? And that was a lot of hard work to go from that day to where we are today, which is over 100 people, two of whom were in that room with me on that day, okay? Two. That was really hard, um, and it went up and down, um, and it's not easy, but your job running a company and being the boss is to lead with a compass and not a map. Brian talked about this. It was awesome. If, you, if, if your CEO or boss starts to get too into the weeds of your day-to-day -day job, that means she hasn't hired the right people to work for her, okay? The job of a CEO and the job of leading a company is to say, this is our vision, this is where we want to go, and to help the team get there. And it's not going to be easy. And we went, again, from 45 to 80 to 60 to 50 to 90 to 40 to over 100 today. And sit, staying up at the compass level, this is where we want to go. This is how we're going to get there and let people fill in the details in the map as well. And it is 24-7. And you have to want that in your soul. Greater than, not equal to means you are driving that and you're waking up feeling, about, feeling that way every day. And only you can make that call. All right, I'm going to be honest with you. It's going to be really bad one day. I don't know what that day is going to be for you, and there's going to be more than one where something bad happens to your business, or something bad happens to one of your customers, or to your boss, or your friend, or you get fired. I hope not, right? But bad stuff happens all the time. And you need to be ready to balance that roller coaster. Startups are a almost a designed stressful experiment. You take really smart, talented, driven people, you put them into a box, and you just throw stuff at them. You think you, you get a big customer win and you are riding high. You get a, a resignation of a, someone on your team that you really care about, and you go all the way down. You will always feel better than you should when you're up here, and worse than you should when it's down here. And it's taken me genuinely 20 years to figure that out and to welcome the roller coaster and not get too freaked out about it. Okay, so think about Bitly. We were started to solve a very simple problem. The links on, on Twitter were too long, 140 characters. And the, it turned out that Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all the social networks that would, would grow were, became more about sharing links to information than it was about sharing selfies, although there's a lot of selfies. But it turned out that links really mattered. And your links were too long, so we needed to shorten them. And we did. And that's how we achieved our massive global scale. OK, so wake up one day and find out that Twitter is launching t.co, a link shortener. Whoa, boy. OK? Think about what happens when you are looking at the news and you see that Twitter is saying, not 140 characters, maybe. 240 characters, right? When your entire business is built on the size of the link, or the perception that your whole business is built on the size of the link, let me tell you sincerely, that's a bottom of the barrel kind of day. Oh my God, the sky is falling. And you may, you'll feel that way, because you'll feel it times 10. Your team is going to be freaking out looking at you to figure out how you feel about it, OK? So what did we do as a company? When Twitter launched Tico, that's when we thought, hey, obviously, we're not going to be the only player here. How can we win? And we had all these customers. And that's when we introduced branded links. That's when we went to our tens of thousands of customers, the New York Times, ESPN, Nike, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, GE, and said, we're going to give you uh, branded short domains, BSDs we call them. So NYTI.MS, ES.PN, right? The branded links that you see on social are, that's us. And now we have tens and tens and tens of thousands. And we changed the story from being about the size of the link to what that link can do for you. And how can that link be less, be, be an asset and a tool that you can use to drive your business? That changed our entire business model. 
in how we thought about things. And when they went from 140 to 240 characters, it was irrelevant to us because the size doesn't matter But because we, we had built features and functionality including mobile deep linking, campaign tools, um, world-class analytics that help people build their businesses, whether you saw the link or not, right? And so when, when the dip of the roller coaster happens, you have to keep in mind how it's, that it's going to come back up and to remind yourself that when you're at the bottom, it's not that bad. And trust me, I have been in my five businesses days away from going out of business. That was pretty bad. But tomorrow's another day and it's going to get better. And when you are riding high, big win, big customer, big hire, right, and you feel like you can take on the world, you should think to yourself, okay, enjoy the moment, but tomorrow's another day. These are roller coaster rides, and you need to be ready for the highs and lows. So this is, for me, the, mo the, be my, the favorite part of my job is recruiting. Okay? They say that a CEO's job are three things. Vision, setting the vision, mission, vision, and values. I say mission, vision, and values, and repeating them until your team says, we get it. We actually take our mission, vision, and value slides that I showed, mission and vision slides, which I showed you. We have one more, which is our six core values with greater than or equal to at the top, are the first three slides in every single presentation that we do. Every single internal presentation, whether it's a product roadmap or an all hands meeting or a marketing update, those slides are at the beginning because I want everybody to know that. So mission, vision, values is, is one. Number two is recruiting and supporting great talent. And number three is making sure we don't run out of money executing on one and two. And as a, at a startup, it's all about the people. You have to always be recruiting. You are always, whether it's a, a beer garden and barbecue, is that what Brian said? Beer and barbecue? Um, if you were here, I would debate him on that. But I think the, the point there is that you're always looking for talent. And you are always playing the long game. There's people that I am networking with today that I know I'm not ready to hire for another year or three or five. I have people on my team today that I've known for years that I nurtured those relationships. I am a little weird that way, like I think about it and think about planting seeds like our friend here that are going to grow into things later. You always have to be recruiting. So it was 2008. I was a first time CEO, a small company called Outside.in, which is a hyperlocal technology company based in Brooklyn, New York, um, that we eventually sold to AOL. But I will tell you that as a first time CEO, I came in thinking, I am going to show the world how great I am. Right? I thought about it in terms of me. I was living in New Jersey, still am, office in Brooklyn. If you know New York, that's two rivers you have to cross. First one in the office every day, last one to leave every day. I had two kids at the time, now three. And I went hard. And I thought to myself, and I would say to my wife, I am going to physically take this company to where it needs to be. And I believed I could, and I believed I would. So we make plans, God laughs, right? So one day, alarm went off. I physically couldn't get out of bed, right? It was the weight of everything was on top of me. I had internalized it all, and I physically couldn't get out of bed. There was, by the way, there's nothing physically wrong with me. It was all emotional. It was all stress, anxiety, depression, you name it, all of it packed into a power punch at like a 6 a.m. alarm going off in my bedroom in New Jersey. It was terrifying, just terrifying. And I'm oversimplifying all the other things and skipping some of the personal stuff that was going on, but you can't because that's all part of the equation. But it was then that I realized this isn't going to work. First of all, you can't run a company if you can't get out of bed, right? Um, and you can't recruit and train and do those three things that I want to do. So I set out to build a different kind of company. And I set out to hire people who could do the jobs that I wasn't good at and to hire people to be awesome, right? And, and each company is at different stages and it's always, it's never a mistake to hire people better than you, ever. And you are not, that one person is not scalable, one person is not a company, everybody's involved in making that better and making that successful and you need to be able to do that. And great talent, 
attracts great talent. To listen to Brian talk about hiring a COO, I hired my first COO last year, um, a guy named Scott Kane, who's in our San Francisco office here. Scott has brought world-class talent into the company from his network um, that I never would have had access to. And that's allowed us to hire some people that are really incredible and really talented, and it's changed my job. And I urge you all to be thinking about how you find better talent, more talent, and know that your individual brand and your legacy will not be about the companies you build or products you ship or code you write or deal you sell, it'll be about the team that you did it with and the people who you were able to surround yourself with. I am thankful of that every day and to my friends from the company who are here today, thank you for helping me see my vision to fruition and to helping to build that. Okay, so fundraising is hard. And if you believe the press that gets written about raising money, you would think that raising money is the finish line. It's actually not. It's the starting line. And I've learned a bunch. I've raised a bunch of money over my career. And a couple of key things that I think are really important. Number one, don't forget that it's the starting line, not the, not the finish line. I don't particularly love celebrating fundraises. Um, it's a validation. I know we need to. Um, as a company, but it's saying we mean to do this. It's not that you've accomplished anything yet. I'll, second thing I know that's really important is that the valuation at which you raise only matters, only matters when you sell the company. I see too much celebration of high valuations, of unicorns, of um, big raises at big dollar values, and I think to myself, Oh boy, they're setting themselves up to fail. When you set a valuation too high, how many people have been in a company where their equity was worth nothing at the end of the day? Right? Okay, good, not that many. Buckle up, guys, because it's coming. Um, the, the truth is, is that you need to find a partner, an investor, who is aligned with you, not only from a financial standpoint, which is really important, valuation needs to be set at a place where you're comfortable and you have room to grow and capture that value, but they need to be aligned with you for your dream and your vision and what you're trying to do. When we went out to raise our round uh, two years ago, I met 40, 50 companies and funds, and we, we were lucky enough to have a pretty robust process, multiple bid, lots of bidders, 10 bidders at the end of the day, and the one that we settled on, Spectrum Equity, growth uh, PE firm here in the Valley, uh, I'd known them for five years, and they had seen us as a company do really well, do really poorly, um, run into like fire drills, uh, and, and have success. And as I went through that process, one of the things that was really resonant with me was when I would talk to people and when I felt like I needed to make us more than what we were, right? You know when you're selling, and if you're across the table from someone, you, I, I know that I have this tendency sometimes, is to think of all the things I think you want to hear about us, right? How do I position ourselves so that you want to buy this product or invest in this company? And what I kept hearing from my partner at Spectrum was, Mark, we love you for who you are. They actually never said those words, but their behavior was such that they said, you've got millions of people using your product. You have an incredible brand. You've got distribution across the world. Don't tell me about the 50 other kinds of companies, company you could become. Let's focus on doing what you do really, really well. That's unbelievably rewarding and, 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 uh, and rare, and really rare, right? So when you can actually sit down with somebody and share what's working and what's not, you're getting married. So if you're fundraising, you should spend as much time as you possibly can with your partner to see if you can imagine being with them when something bad happens. Because like I said, something bad is going to happen and you need a real partner to help you see through all of that. So find someone who loves you for who you really are in your personal and your professional life. Because as I said, there's no real distinction. Okay, so the payoff. This is where we get to the end of the story here. Remember that little boy every day pulled the weeds, sprinkled the ground with water, and the whole world was telling him it wasn't going to work. 
So spoiler alert, it works. The year was 2011, uh, and we had just sold our company to AOL. We were 20 people, um, mostly, uh, well, 20 people, great, talented team, and we found ourselves, I'll spare the lead up to this, but at a, on a Tuesday night in Atlantic City in February. If you could think of a more depressing place to be, I would be impressed. Tuesday night at a steakhouse in Atlantic City, 20 of us around a table, and we had just sold the company, and we had, a, we had won. And we looked around the table. I remember it, I remember it to this day, and every time I tell this story, I, I physically feel and remember how that felt, to be sitting around the table with people that we had gone to, we didn't go to war, but we had worked really, really hard and accomplished something that few people get to accomplish. And I knew, as I thought about that cold day in New Jersey when I couldn't get out of bed and looking around at the team that I had built and the people that had done all the work. The CEOs don't do the job, they help people do the job. And I had such tremendous love for the people in that room and appreciation for what we had built. That is a high that I've never gotten anywhere else. I've tried, never gotten there. And the goal that I'm chasing at Bitly, yes, there's a financial return, yes, there's professional growth, yes, there is doing interesting things, getting opportunities like this to stand center stage at a phenomenal rock and roll theater, it's the closest I'll probably ever get. But it's to cross that finish line and look out across the table at my team and know that we did something together. Nothing feels better than winning with a team. Trust me, nothing. And that's what I want you to take as well. So, all this hard work that this boy did every single day, picking up the weeds, sprinkling the ground with water. His mother says, I'm afraid it won't come up. His father says, son, I'm afraid it's not going to come up. And his big brother says, it's not coming up. But, one day, it came up, just as the little boy knew that it would. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time.